highly decorated visual artist with a rich tapestry of experiences, including undergraduate printmaking at my alma mater, Syracuse University, an MFA at Pratt in Brooklyn, uh, professorial stints, including our own Delaware Art Museum. Close to home, a show of uh, W.A.S. Hatch's recent work will be on exhibit at the Delaware Center of Contemporary Arts, known as the Contemporary January 22nd through May 30th, incredible. Uh, the official opening will be on Friday, February 4th, uh, and we will have time to touch on some of that amazing life experience. But first, Wendy, we wanna start right here in the Highlands. Talk to us about your patch of the neighborhood. My passion of the neighborhood? Your patch, how do you think you're Yeah, I, you're Highlands. so modern, I'm so old fashioned. My passion for the neighborhood is ongoing, honestly. We moved from a semi-detached home to a larger home 35 years ago or so, and have been here ever since, would go nowhere else, not too much land to take care of and mow, because we still mow over here, and on the parkway, and we've seen the parkway evolve yeah, from sure. being kind of hokey, run down, nothing too special, nice. But in this day and age, homeowners have really taken on all their homes in the neighborhood and are now really concerned about their fronts, their facades, their plantings, the lighting around the neighborhood has improved. Mm -hmm. And it's really become a wonderful place for a mix of all ages and sidewalk, walk, dog walkers to be exact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're all around here and it's a wonderful access to all we have. Yeah. So can you tell us how, what was your journey to the Highlands? Where did you grow up? Oh, that, that's a long journey. <laughs> but in fact, uh, I grew up in Connecticut and then off to college uh, to Syracuse University and then further on to graduate school at Pratt Institute. And from there you graduate, you're an artist with no place to go, no money, and no options, which put me down on Myrtle Avenue under the L with the train rolling by into a storefront studio with a cooperative of about five others. And we pooled our money to pay for the rent and printing presses of all places were right there because I was a printmaker of etching, lithography. We had a little gas uh, heater you heated it up and I was the only person ever in there. All the others never showed up. So I worked there for about a year doing a portfolio of prints. And in that year I secured a job teaching uh, printmaking out at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. So packed the U-Haul and out <laughs> we went. I was married to Denison at that point. And then six years of teaching there Denison took a job in Delaware, and we moved to Delaware, another U-Haul, but this time with a printing press. And so this time I arrived with a printing press, and out it came, and upstairs it went into a bedroom, and there I began my artwork again. So it's progressed, and in this house, it's up on the third floor, great light, uh, no printing press anymore. That went to the basement. And I eventually gave that to the Delaware College of Art and Design. Left my printing acid and other uh, problems behind that go with it. It's a lot of um, technical stuff that not that difficult. It's all historic, but it's, it's the acids, the solvents uh, are not healthy. So I moved past that one. Here I am. So you, you know, I've been pouring Wendy over written materials um, to try and bone up and um, <laughs> do a worthy job, job worthy of your career. And I, the, just the very first few sentences really, really knocked my socks off. And I hoped you could sort of translate for me as a layman that you're fascinated by the relationship between abstract forms in space and intense colors and its vibration. All I know is that I want to be around that. I do too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the answer. I really like color. In this day and age, when people live in neutral homes, uh, it doesn't spark a real personality to me. It's fine and lovely, but we live within color of our rooms. 
And secondly, in painting, I have all the privilege, like this one behind me, to add as much color or take it away as I want to. So color brings a real positive light to me. And I think as an artist, I didn't know that as a youngster. You know, in college, uh, my printmaking instructor was upstate moody, outgoing guy, but the artwork was very moody and sketchy and deep feeling. I thought, that's what artists are. I'm not. I really like the world around me to be a little more positive. And so I have gone that way. The word vibrations is a fancy one, but maybe the paintings have a little bit of a vibration to them. Yeah. Um, so in regard to your art career, you go by w.a.shatch in your career. Yeah. Um, yeah. What does that mean? What role has gender played for you? Well, you're asking the right question. Basically, I started as an artist in the 70s, uh, postgraduate school, and the women's movement was really hot and heavy then. And being part of a young woman in her early 20s, uh, mid-20s by that point, you can't help but be part of your own time. And that's probably why I got hired at Bradley University. I mean, there are probably six jobs in the country and snagging a woman printmaker into one of those jobs for one of these universities was considered a very positive move. So I did get a job. All those men who are just as qualified as the women, um, they didn't get the jobs, but I got the job. And that then launched me into a series of prints uh, that were based on a face. And these were etchings and lithographs because I'm schooled in both of those. But the name, W-A-S, is Wendy Ann Swanson Hatch. And Hatch is a symmetrical word. The H is an H, a T in the middle, it's a nice symmetry. And if I stack my W-A-S on top of it and that below, that to me was such an interesting visual. And it also meant no one knew I was a woman. So when I made these applications I could get for jobs, I could get a response and uh, not be told, oh, we're not interested in, or come up with the prejudice of the times. So it was really a feminist statement uh, to, to initial your name rather than to just put a full Wendy Hatch on there. And well, it's worth noting, you snagged that Bradley job really, yeah. uh, in a really creative manner, right? You made a kind of wanted poster and sort of made it, distributed it nationally and right. sort of, right. you know, kind of like you sent out some really powerful hooks. I also yeah. want to see if I understand correctly that that cooperative in Brooklyn was called the uh, Apocalypse, Apocalypse Cooperative, is that right? Apocalypse, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, anybody who wants to join a band called Apocalypse Cooperative, I'm in. I'll play drums, whatever you need. Wendy. <laughs> Well, this, this was a humble studio there in Brooklyn on Myrtle Avenue. But, you know, you bundled up and turned on the heater and hope, you know, nothing froze. But that was another era. And after that, having my own studio was really my goal in life. And so by teaching at a university, I could use their facilities and buy my own printing press and set up my own press in the one bedroom apartment we lived in and Dennis and I slept on a convertible couch for six years, just so we could do that. So that's, that's that era of my life. Um, but coming to Wilmington, that was a whole nother era uh, of being able to have running water that when you needed it, we took the kitchen sink and put it in a bedroom. And we're talking a 1920s hung on the wall sink I had a plumber move it upstairs into the bedroom. Um, and there I had a print studio. So, you know, you make it work um, without fanfare. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about, um, the. you talked about institutions a little bit. Interested in how some of the specific mentors you've had uh, and some of the institutions have played a role in your career, how they bolstered yeah. you and how do you, yeah. how do you pay that forward? Well, basically, I think I'll, I'll give college the, the credit for it. Um, that's when I really learned that there are actually artists out 
there. You know, growing up in suburban Connecticut, this is not necessarily where you're gonna bump into an artist. Um, I didn't know really what it was. Going to college, you met these professionals that were teaching, wonderful art school at Syracuse. But that particular printmaking instructor was one of these magnetic personalities and thus I was pulled into printmaking, enjoyed that in that time. From there, it really became being part of a faculty of other artists in the Midwest that also nurtured, oh, you can do this. Um, I ran a national print and drawing exhibition out there for three different times, met tons of artists, not just from the Midwest, but all over the country that applied to this. Um, and you really were, work your way into the Chicago art world of galleries, New York, a major show in New York uh, up at the Prince, and finally letting go of all that, becoming a family in Wilmington was not a hotbed of art. <laughs> um, and it was fine with me. There were other priorities. I'm happy to be an artist, happy to live in Wilmington, wonderful place to do everything, not just one thing from Chicago, which was the art. Um, and so here we are in the Highlands with uh, really a balanced life. And I think that was ultimately my goal was to get to the balance and not be just a starving artist. Um, but I found opportunities here teaching at Widener University for 28 years, mm -hmm. teaching over at the Delaware Art Museum. That was wonderful as well. Meeting other artists from the Delaware Contemporary, got that up and going, was part of some of the background to that. Um, and then I can go into cruise control, which is kind of where I am now. Others have stepped up to lead these areas and I can just enjoy the fruits of their labors and enjoy making my own art without the, the weighty obligation of, of leading and forming groups, um, really just participate without having to lead at all. And that's a pretty nice place to find yourself with time to paint and consider what you wanna do. Mm. So first I wanna just see if there's any audience questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can come off mute or raise your hand. Um, but Wendy, you've worked with so many different uh, medias. So printmaking, watercolor, acrylic on canvas. One, what is your favorite? Um, and then I guess, what is your relationship uh, when you work with these different medias? Is it a love-hate? <laughs> it, it changes. It changes always. That We've talked a lot about the printmaking, but that ended uh, probably 20 years ago. And that came to a natural end. Health hazards and the arts are something to consider in my business. Um, and that was fine. Hey, happy to put that aside did pastels for a while on Japanese rice papers. And I had a grant to travel in Japan and brought home papers and found that drawing on those was a fascinating process. That evolved to watercolor at the Delaware Art Museum. And I had dabbled with watercolor. That was not new to me. I had never taught it. But by teaching it, you actually, I actually schooled myself to a higher level to the point where I was happy to do exclusive, large, big watercolors. Um, and those watercolors were part of my life for a good 10, 12 years. Um, and they were shown locally. MBNA bought a dozen of them uh, over several years, decorated a whole restaurant in Newark with them. And they accumulated them over a series of years. And then they looked at them all and said, let's put them all together. Uh, and we did that. And then from the watercolors came the idea that, you know, I've done this, I do it very well, teach watercolor at the museum, uh, enjoy all of that, but it gets to be the same old. Maybe it's kind of like careers that evolve, changes for <laughs> Benjamin, who has changed his career and moved on. Um, and so for me, I moved on to easel painting or acrylic on canvas. And that has been very nice, so easy compared to watercolor. Change your mind, move the colors, 
over paint. Start with a canvas like this one, paint it in orange edge to edge, and then come up with the image. Um, it's fun, just plain fun. You go into another zone. Um, favorite? Oh, come on. That one's a tough one. It's like having favorite children. You don't have those. <laughs> you just enjoy what you have produced. All right. Well, it looks like we've got two audience. Well, no, we have a couple audience questions. So um, if I can take, I'll start with the most recent. If I can find Holly and Wayne, I'm going to take you off mute or um, you can, I can ask your question for you, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, you can ask it for me. Hi, Hi, <laughs> Hi Wendy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she's very curious about the mural that is um, right. Please tell us about the audience, about the fabulous mural you created in your home. So I'm not sure if she's referencing the one behind you or if there's another no. question. Yeah. Uh, spotlight. Uh, uh, the painting behind me is hanging on the wall. But in our front hall is a mural. And the mural was when we were working on this house over a series of years, you know, what do you do with all this wall space? And I decided, well, I'll paint a mural of the things that are close to me. And so there's a painting of a ship, Denison's family, historically it was involved with early American stuff, shipping of interest to them. Winter tour kind of pops up in another section, the Brandywine in another section. And I just stepped up to the wall and painted it. Kids were little. Erica, daughter Erica had a sponge when she was probably eight or nine helping me. She just tap away. I said, yeah, that's the right color in the right place. And then I would sort of elaborate on it. And so the mural went up and I forget about it. Holly, thanks for asking. I mean, I walk right past it. So that's cute. Um, it looks like we have another question uh, from Margaret. Um, Wendy, how do you choose your subjects to paint? That's a great one. Yeah, that is a good one, Margaret. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, it has to sort of just catch me. Something I look and it, you just go, oh, I want to do that. And some of these ideas, um, most of them come from photographs. I'll take a bunch of photographs. Say, I really like the way the sun is shining on that road and reflecting. Um, or there's a case of a painting that I have, uh, probably the last one I finished for the show downtown, is of rooftops from my studio. And if you look at my dormer there, about two years ago, there was, I think it's the holiday season, people are home and the lights are all up high. And I looked out that dormer window I was fascinated by the lights of the neighbors' houses, just the rooftops showing. There it is. Um, yes. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, I should go get my cell phone or a camera. Well, by the time I thought of it and the distractions of the house, I didn't get the picture. So for the next two years in the winter months, because the leaves are out in the summer, I was out snapping pictures and there's never a snowfall the same. The lights were never the same. And so I had to keep saying, well, I, this is at least the architecture of it. I'm just going to have to add everything else myself and turn it back into that night scene. So some things take a long time, but it's seeing a view, uh, image, since I've done recently more landscape things, that goes, yes, that, that's what I want to do. Uh, there's some others that I've done recently, actually not by design, but portraits of, uh, of the family, but all from the back, their backs in settings that were theirs. And I was fascinated by that kind of concept. This one is uh, Longwood Gardens out there. Um, they're lily pads. I think they're South African maybe, or South American, I could be wrong. I was just told the other day what that was. But anyway, um, and fun, I can change those lilies, I can brush the paint in there without any effort, and brush stroke interests me. It's one of those little esoteric things about arts. I love the way brushes go down and how you can touch and quit if you can recognize it. Most of us go, oh, I'll redo it. But no, if you can stop early, that's a wonderful feeling. 
Um, and it looks like Izzy Mead has a question and she um, wants to know what artist inspires you? I knew somebody might ask me that question. That worried me no end. So Izzy, here goes. If I go way back, it would be to Franz Hals, a 17th century artist, Dutch artist, known for portraits, these very stately looking people with big lacy collars and black outfits uh, on black backgrounds. Okay, so that's 17th century portraiture, not me. But what this artist did and what I was so fascinated by seeing back in college was his brush strokes. And I just mentioned that about the lily pads. Brush strokes interest me. And I can't always get there. You know, it's one of those elusive things. But that guy could paint a hand and a knuckle and boom, done with four strokes. Yet realism was part of it. And since I'm a realist, I've always strived for that. And then if I come forward to say graduate school, um, the artist that I really liked there was Janet Fish. And Janet Fish uh, is a New York artist who's known for glass and um, objects she finds at tag sales. And she'll arrange them with light and their color and their cast shadows. I thought she was terrific. Just the color world that she just burst wide open. Um, and if I go from there, well, then I kind of slip away into people like Alice Neal, uh, who was an elderly painter. And Alice also just called it as she saw it. No, no framing of beauty, et cetera. Andy Warhol was an example of hers. She painted the famous, so he was one of the ones she painted portraiture. And she's known for portraiture. Wow, I mean, she just did it with brush strokes. So moving into that world, I then sort of found myself a little more, I guess I could say isolated here in Delaware, just going down my own road, my own way, taking in this history that made a big impression on me from those days. All right, and so what role does the neighborhood play in your body of work? Say that one more time. What role does the neighborhood play in uh, your body of work? Well, the show down the Delaware Contemporary is called Close to Home. Oh. And Close to Home is telling the story about me looking out my window down Kentmere, a site, you saw the painting of out the studio window. Um, backyard snow, that looks interesting. That's the uh, light is cast. This painting here is a big diptych, two paintings put together to make one. And the big diptych uh, is not the Brandywine, although it could be. Uh, we were biking down in North Carolina and I was on a bridge looking down into the water. And I thought, whoa, I wonder if I could pull that off in a painting. And I stood there and I biked back another day, took those photos. And then I played and changed it to kind of fit what I wanted. Because uh, the photo is the starting point. The end point is what I do with the color or in this case, the brush strokes. Mm -hmm. So I do, I'm a homebody. And so being a homebody, you know, there were the years of painting still lives that I lit in the studio, then moved on now to to light and shadow on the Brandywine. There's a lovely painting in the show, Brandywine Blue, that uh, is of the Brandywine. Um, Rockford Park, you know, our, our, our wonderful Senator, um, Sarah McBride has a great painting that'll be in the show of Rockford Park and the Sledders. So, you know, I see it, I think, and usually, think about it a long time before it hits the canvas is a commitment. When you commit to that canvas, I don't let go until it's done. Wendy, every time I, when I, when, when I pitched you this, when, when, when you've given me tours and we've talked about your work, you, you often um, sort of demure or defer to a larger community of local artists. Yes. And I'm interested in who are your local contemporaries and how do you support one another? 
Okay. In our highlands, we have a good collection of artists that I'll say we are under the radar. You know, we're not hanging out with greasy black hair and ripped blue jeans, but I can tell you who some of them are. Graham Doggerty uh, around the corner. He's a painter with a studio at the Delaware Contemporary. He does large uh, abstracts that have a rectangular format to them. Ruth Ansel around the corner on Bancroft. Ruth is a small painting, very delicate painter with egg tempera. Uh, Carol Spiker up on Wood Road. Those wonderful figures um, that are set in all kinds of settings, very simple. They almost look cut out, but they're just placed perfectly composed. Bill Spiker, her husband, a sculptor, He's welding outside. If you're up there, you may see the sparks flying and Bill out there with his welding equipment. Um, next door is Carol, um, Caroline Brown, who does collages of a variety of things. And she too has a studio down at the Contemporary. So these are just some of the people that are around. Maxine Rosenthal has shared a studio. She's a metal artist, small jewelry. Uh, and she's here too. So. We're, we're here tucked in, we're involved with the contemporary, the museum, uh, we're not fussy. We're all one large art community, but with different facets of it. And all of us tend to support the organizations and each other. Well, Wendy, close to home, a show of W.A.S. Hatch's recent work is on exhibit at the Delaware Center of Contemporary Arts, January 22nd through May 30th. Uh, the official opening will be Friday, February 4th. Um, looks like we have one more question for Greg from Greg. We're gonna get this under the wire before we thank uh, Wendy for joining. Um, Wendy's made major contributions to Winsminster Church. I hope there's a question in here. She's chosen carpeting, furniture and colors uh, and made enormous colorful banners. So I will turn that into a question, Greg. Talk to us about that work, please. Well, you know, to me, artwork can go many directions. It's not just paint on canvas, pencil on paper. You know, you can really look at the world and say, how can we just make this artistically more interesting a composition? One of the most fun projects I did for the church were banners for their, goodness, I think, I'm not gonna say what anniversary, because I can't remember if it was 75 <laughs> or 100 years, but anyway. 125th in, yeah, okay. 125th, thank you. And so uh, we made those when I was teaching at Widener. Greg Jones' wife was there helping me. Camilla was there night and day trying to get these things done. I was to sewing, painting, and hanging them. Yeah. There were probably a half, no, maybe 10 of them. I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's one project with fabrics. Love fabric. Love color on the wall. Painted a mural for the kids there. You know, this is fun. <laughs> Why? Yeah, this is what I do. Same as putting flowers in the garden. To me, it's all the same. Well, we are so grateful you are woven into the fabric of our community. Close to Home opens uh, January 22nd at the Contemporary. Wendy, thank you for joining us on Highlands Live. It was a pleasure. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thus concludes season two. Uh, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, everyone. We will see you in Rockford Park. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>